Well, hi everyone. Um, it is a pleasure for us to have uh, Richard May Miller for giving the colloquium today. So Richard graduated with a bachelor's degree in engineering with friends, which is really unusual but interesting, from the University of Bath in 1978. After two years uh, in the railway, railway signaling business of uh, Westinghouse Brake and Signal Company, he resumed his studies to obtain a diploma de engineer from the University of Technology of Campagne in France and a master's degree in design of production machines uh, from the Cranfield Institute of Technology. While studying at Cranfield, uh, Richard encouraged uh, the Cranfield Unit uh, for Precession Engineering, an organization dedicated to achieving the highest possible accuracy in machinery. Uh, he worked there uh, specializing in control systems, software, and project management for the remainder of his professional career. During that time, uh, he taught uh, precession engineering topics, especially error budgeting and machine calibration to graduate students at Cranfield and the MIT. He was also an active member of the committees that produced British and international standards for machine tools, gear metrology, and coordinate measuring machines. Uh, finally, he took early retirement in 2016 to be able to spend more time studying music and visiting Spain. And we hope you enjoy that part. Please. Thank you very much, So I'm Richard May Miller, and I spent most of my career with, in uh, Cranfield Precision. The Cranfield Precision started as the Cranfield Unit for Precision Engineering in 1968 and was established to try and improve the transmission of scientific knowledge to between industry and uh, the universities. <clears throat> and leading by example, rather than uh, merely delivering lectures and so on, they soon went into production of actually manufacturing machines and products to enable high precision. In 1987, the uh, activities had become rather too commercial for the university and uh, we were privatized as Cranfield Precision Engineering Limited, still belonging to the university. Then when the university wanted a bit more money, they sold us in uh, 1995 <coughs> and uh, now we are part of the FIV group with a headquarters in France. But our, our, this precision engineering activity I'm going to talk about is still based uh, in, in the Cranfield and Bedford area in the middle of England. We're not astronomers. We are specialists in high-tech machinery. And, uh, but uh, that uh, uh, expertise in precision machinery has uh, been an enabling technology for many astronomy projects. So I thought it would be interesting for you to see uh, some of that application. In this talk, I'm going to mention six different machines that we've made for astronomical purposes. As there's not enough time to describe each of the machines in detail, I shall be uh, focusing on a few points that I think are particularly interesting. Machine number one, the large diamond turning machine. This was built in 1982 um, and was just being completed when I joined the company. <coughs> It's a vertical axis diamond turning lathe. A lathe is torno in uh, Espanol, <coughs> if you like. The uh, work piece is here. It's on a, a rotary table. And uh, a boring tool comes down inside to machine the, the surface. <coughs> and this is, uh, has real relevance to the history of astronomy in that it made the telescopes for the ROSAT and SXT telescope mirrors. <coughs> Uh, most of you will be very conscious of the fact that X-ray telescopes can't use ordinary mirrors because X-rays go through things <coughs> rather than bouncing off them. But with grazing incidents, we can uh, focus X-rays off uh, solid surfaces. And this picture was, uh, represents the Chandra telescope, but it shows the form of, uh, of the mirrors that we have to produce. They're close to being hollow cylinders. Uh, a, a, a particularly important design constraint for these is that they get launched into space, so they have to be lightweight. And that means the walls of these cylinders are thin. If we produce them on a normal lathe, which has a horizontal axis, then the whole shape would sag and deform, so we get the wrong shape. 
Uh, so we have to produce them in, in a vertical orientation, <coughs> which uh, is not necessarily the optimum shape for, for our machine. It gives us some design problems with the machine, as we shall see. The other thing I'd like to uh, point out, then, if th this would represent one side of the part. The axes uh, we denominate uh, Z along the axis of the part and X going into the part. And uh, that means that when we're considering machine design, <coughs> we're particularly worried about errors in the X direction because those will go straight into the component, whereas errors in the Z direction are tangential to the surface of the component, so it's a less sensitive direction. <coughs> Here's a slide from a uh, lecture on machine design. We can usually model machines as being made up of some rigid elements which move relative to one another. <coughs> and the rigid body has six degrees of freedom. Uh, in this slide, we're representing, uh, this is a moving carriage of a machine which is sitting in the guideway here. So we want it to move in this direction only with a pure linear motion. But in fact, in, uh, in any real system, there are going to be error motions in the other five degrees of freedom. <coughs> they, you can see in this representation the, the axis is sitting in this guideway held down by gravity, which is quite a, an easy, convenient way of making a, a system that's not over-constrained. As soon as we go to a vertical axis, we don't have that help from gravity to keep the axis uh, in position. Uh, 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 constrained in its linear motion. Instead, we have gravity fighting against the work of the motor to position the axis. So we, we've got two additional problems when we use, have a vertical axis. This slide shows a cross-section through that machine that you saw a photograph of a few slides ago. So here is the workpiece, the, the X-ray telescope mirror. It rotates on a high-precision air bearing here. Uh, this is the base of the machine. The, the machine's designed to be self-rigid, so it sits just on three points and isn't affected by the, uh, any distortion of the ground. <coughs> the yellow block here represents the x-axis, so it's quite a, a big chunk that moves in and out in the x-direction. And the blue part here is the z-axis, the vertical axis. Now, the vertical axis is guided in this area and will, as I say, have error motions <coughs> in various directions, <coughs> including particularly a rotational error in this direction, which is made worse for us because we have to put the tool on the end of a long arm to reach inside the component that we're going to be cutting or measuring. So th this amplifies... A, a rotational error at this point to produce a linear error in the x direction which is our most sensitive direction that we're most worried about to overcome that here's a picture representing the uh, <coughs> this this z axis in isolation so this here is holding the either the cutting tool or a, a measuring instrument to overcome that problem we have produced a, a, a second bar that comes down parallel to the, uh, the one that holds the tool. <coughs> and on the end of that bar, we mount an, uh, a laser interferometer, which measures the X displacement of the machine relative to a reference straight edge. So we've, um, we're now measuring, by measuring at the height of the tool, we're automatically compensating for this error motion because the, the x-axis is made directly without a, a parallax error. <coughs> and uh, we could uh, then servo off, off this measurement rather than, uh, rather than going back to measuring the, this position of the x-axis relative to the base. We could measure directly here and uh, get rid of the, uh, <coughs> the geometric error that I was talking about. Uh, few of you will have seen a reflective reference straight edge, so here I thought I'd put this uh, picture in, which is of one that we use for uh, calibration uh, work on our machines. This uh, 
This is a lapped surface. Uh, and down the middle of it has been deposited a reflective stripe, which is also electrically conductive. So we can use that for either reflective or um, for a capacitance measurement. And that this can be calibrated uh, even better than it's actually manufactured to, uh, as, a, as a reference artifact. Here's uh, pictures of the metrology equipment actually in, in use on an SXT mirror. This is another setup measuring diameter. Here we have the, the probe that I'd shown in the previous slides, which will be moving down the inside of the part. And back here is positioned the reflective straight edge. And here is the, uh, here's the laser interferometer that measures relevant, rel relative to that uh, straight edge. Some actual results. In practice, we didn't use that measuring system actually during cutting operation because there would be debris flying around and coolant. So that um, uh, potentially interferes with the interferometer. <coughs> and so we, the cutting operation is done by uh, generating a series of points which, uh, which are interpolated by the machine to generate the curve on the, on the component. That, that, that the curve is then cut then we repeat the movement, this time with a measurement probe, and this upper line here is the result of a measurement <coughs> on, the, on the part. Then uh, at that time, it was quite a laborious manual process um, to, uh, for each of those data points I'd mentioned that we're interpolating with the machine, we find the corresponding error of this uh, measurement process. We add that to the point, so now we have a series of points that are slightly distorted from the theoretical curve. But because the errors of the machine are very repeatable, when we now do the cutting operation with that slightly distorted curve and then repeat the measurement operation, we get this second line down here, which uh, show uh, reducing the error from about four microns to less than half a micron on the surface of the part. That's, uh, that's the first machine I wanted to talk about. Um, but uh, as a transition to the next one, uh, we, we did an experimental cutting, though it's not optimised for this, of making an off-axis parabolic mirror on that machine. So it's turning this part uh, about half a metre off the centre of the rotary table. <coughs> There's the part in isolation. Now, uh, that part's half a metre off-axis, uh, off but uh, you astronomers would rather have uh, mirror segments that are up to 20 metres off uh, axis. Now, we can't make this machine 20 metres or 40 metres across. Um, but what we, do, what we can do is say, well, off axis, we know the mathematical description of that part. We can put it in the centre of a, of a work zone and, if, and move a machine in x, y and z coordinates to generate the shape that you wanted off axis. And that's what this uh, machine number two was designed and built to do. <coughs> so this is the OAGM 2500, off OAGM standing for off-axis grinding machine. We produced it for uh, Kodak Special Optics in Rochester, New York. <coughs> um, <coughs> I'll move straight on to the next photo. This is me 30 years ago. I was in charge of the control system for this machine. <coughs> um, <coughs> As you can see, it's a big machine. Um, the, the, the work zone uh, here is 2.5 metres by 2.5 metres. And uh, it has a height, uh, it can machine uh, depths of 600 millimetres. <coughs> but for, in spite of being uh, so big, it's still not big enough to be stiff enough for the high accuracy parts that we want to make. In fact, uh, one of the uh, design constraints on this machine was that it has to all be dismantled, put into standard shipping containers, shipped across the Atlantic and rebuilt on the other side of the Atlantic. So you can see here the, the, there are big rectangular chunks which are in fact bolted together. It's a bit more than just bolted together. There is a, a, a bond in between the two, but, uh, but basically it's rectangular lumps bolted together. And, and this would make a machine that's not really uh, inherently stiff enough for what we want to do. 
I'm not going to talk in detail about the uh, cutaway picture here, but, the, but it is rather pretty, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, what I wanted to point out in this slide is the, the axes of the machine. <coughs> uh, the the x-axis consists of this entire bridge structure here, moving up and down on, on the base. So that's a, and that's a 30 tons of, of uh, material moves up and down the machine, and uh, and therefore is going to be distorting the base as it goes. <coughs> the y-axis is this carriage here moving across, and the z-axis moves up and down here. In the next slides, I'm going to show a series of uh, of how the machine goes together. <coughs> As I said, it's uh, made up of rectangular blocks that, uh, that are bolted together, and, and these, this is the outside uh, lump, if you like, the, on which the rest of the machine sits. <coughs> In, now, uh, here, I've taken away the, uh, the first, the two from the front here, so that you can get a better view of how the, uh, the rest of the machine goes together. So, in the middle of that lot, we locate a, a big block, which is the work table. On, that, uh, on this is going to sit the uh, component to be machined <coughs> and we uh, hope and assume that the component to be machined won't move relative to the work table. <coughs> on the sides of the work table we've, uh, we've put some kinematic locations, basically locations for, formed of three spheres and on those uh, on that kinematic mount, we locate this square, hollow square, that goes around the outside of the work table. The essential thing about a kinematic location is that it repeatably locates where something will go without over-constraining it. So it's not as though it was screwed down so that the, the, if, if anything moves on the support, then the component will dis then the then this square will distort. This square stays... Uh, it retains its form, even even if there's some movement of the stuff underneath. It may move uh, in, in its entirety, but it's not so um, so secured that it will that it will distort with the movements of the machine. Uh, the other essential point here is that on top of this square I've just mentioned are two big rectangular lumps, and these are uh, reflective straight edges like those we saw on the previous machine, but much bigger. 2.75 meters long. Fortunately, Kodak, uh, being manufacturers of large optics, uh, supplied these to us for a issue. They're not the sort of stuff you uh, uh, <coughs> go down and uh, again get off the shelf at the supermarket. <coughs> so, putting the machine back together, they're restoring the outside of the rectangle. Then, on top of that, we mount uh, the main x-axis which is going to move up and down here and, and consists of this big bridge. On top of that the y-axis which moves up and down this direction and on that we hang the z-axis which moves up and down here. <coughs> the, um, now compared with the previous machine where we were worried about the uh, X direction as being the sensitive direction normal to the component surface, in this case the components are, are more or less uh, horizontal and the sensitive direction is Z, <coughs> vertical. <coughs> That's the direction that will make the biggest dent in the surface of the component. <coughs> And these are the two important features of the machine that we need to monitor the position of a measuring probe and a grinding wheel which will actually cut the glass. <coughs> to, uh, to, to get an uh, independent uh, metrology of, the, of that dimension, we then put a, a second beam across here, again kinematically mounted, so this beam won't distort even though these pieces are moving around <coughs> and uh, that beam is used to hold a third reflective straight edge here, this time with its reflective surface facing downwards. So now we're isolating those metrology components uh, in colour now from the, from the rest of the machine structure. We have a, uh, a square down here that is located relative to the 
work piece via the work table. We have two reflector straight edges here and a third one across the top. And the red lines represent uh, laser interferometer measurement paths so that we can measure various things relative to one another. So the, I think probably best to move straight to the next diagram. Looking along the x-axis of the machine, then we have the workpiece here. We have a pair of, of reflective straight edges which are fixed relative to the workpiece. We monitor the position of this straight edge using two interferometers A and B. We can measure down from this to the point of interest, which is either a probe or a grinding wheel, with the measurement C. The value we're really interested in is Z. And so it um, becomes, a, uh, as a first approximation, just a case of doing a linear interpolation between the measurements A and B. Uh, and and uh, according to the distance you've moved in the, in the y direction and a fairly simple calculation. But the, in practice, it's much more difficult because the A, B, and C laser measurements are all uh, lasers measuring in air. So the laser count is distorted by the variations of the wavelength uh, as, as, air, uh, as, it, um, as the temperature, pressure, gas composition, humidity of the air changes. <clears throat> so there's a fairly significant cal calculation to be made uh, to convert each of these measurements into millimetres or micrometres <coughs> from laser counts. On top of that, uh, the straight edges were not as straight as we would like. So we had correction tables for the straight edges and the measurement C, for example, as well as being a function of how far up and down it is, is also a function of Y uh, as uh, as a, as a correction to the uh, to, to the uh, to the straightness of this axis, and sim similarly, A and B vary um, have have a correction as a function of x because the straight edge isn't straight. <coughs> so um, the, that represents then quite a, a heavy calculation burden to be done uh, every few milliseconds to update the uh, the machine servos. <coughs> That was a simplified view of the laser system. There are actually nine axes in total of, of lasers, which I'm not going to go into. <laughs> now, and, uh, although Kodak don't tell us much about what they do with the machine, this rather beautiful component was, uh, I've seen a, a photo of it being ground on the machine. So this is a test segment for the James, w, James Webb Space Telescope. Um, they didn't eventually adopt this technology. They used beryllium mirrors in the end. But uh, the, they, um, in, in the development process, they did several uh, options. Uh, Kodak are masters of, of making these uh, complicated structures out of glass. So the, this hexagonal structure that you can see in here is the, gives the stiffness to the mirror. But on, on top of that, there's a thin layer of glass about three millimetres thick, which is the surface that was actually ground by our... Uh, instrument and, and then polished and will then have a reflective uh, surface put on it. <coughs> so moving on to the next machine, uh, there was a, a bit of a catastrophe for the uh, astronomy technology business in 1990 when having launched the most perfect telescope in the world they discovered it didn't work uh, or at least it gave fuzzy pictures. <coughs> And um, th the fact was that they'd made an absolutely brilliant primary mirror, uh, but used incorrect metrology to, to measure it, and only, used, only believed one method of metrology, even if something else disagreed, they th decided th that, that one way was the good one. <coughs> uh, and at that time, Perkin Elmer, who, who polished that mirror a few years before, um, uh, were already making the next set of mirrors, which were for AXAF, uh, which then became the Chandra um, X-ray telescope. And uh, they suddenly decided they had a requirement for more methods of metrology on their mirror. 
and uh, so we had a rush job uh, producing the uh, circularity and inner diameter measurement instrument <coughs> for, for Chandra telescope mirrors. <coughs> Uh, and that the resulting uh, uh, machine doesn't win any beauty competitions, but uh, that, that's uh, that's what it looked like. Uh, we we uh, we worked hard to produce this in in only a few months with the uh, engineers from uh, Perkin Elmer. Uh, it's going to be more clear if I show you the this diagrammatic view, though it's not so pretty. <coughs> uh, the dotted lines here. Are representing a uh, one of the uh, mirrors that they're, they're polishing. Our instrument goes up inside the middle of that <coughs> mirror. These red pieces here are contacting mechanical probes and there's a system of laser interferometry onto the back end of those probes that, uh, to, to measure their position. In operation that they would go up inside these uh, reference artifacts which are, are calibrated to a known um, so that the distance uh, the internal dimension there is known <coughs> and then they're driven out to contact with the part to give a, a diameter measurement on the part and then the whole thing can rotate to check the consistency of diameter and circularity that means uh, that required a particularly good uh, rotary axis which uh, we were fortunately making some uh, as uh, lathe spindles at the time and uh, you can see going back to the principle of the six degrees of freedom that I was talking about we want this axis to rotate perfectly we're, that's the degree of freedom we want but it's actually going to have an error motion that will go like that for instance and uh, with the amplification of that uh, due to this point here being something like two meters above the bearing that uh, any error there would uh, would would uh, be considerably exaggerated. In fact, the uh, people at Perkin Elmer were so impressed with that bearing, they sent a letter to the technician who assembled it and said they'd never seen such a, a fantastically good rotary axis bearing before. <coughs> Here's a couple of pictures then of that instrument in use. Uh, this is looking down, that's the top of our instrument here with the mirror around the outside and a big uh, metal framework supporting it. And this is really the same setup. You've got met metal framework. The brown piece here is the actual mirror made of Zerodur. And uh, there's our instrument uh, sticking out of the top. <coughs> and with that, they produced these mirrors like this. Uh, this chap is standing inside the mirror. Uh, amazing piece of glass that uh, our mind boggles at what the cost must be of, of a piece of, of Zerador that size and shape <coughs> even before you've started polishing it to uh, some uh, excellence of uh, parabola or hyperbola <coughs> so from there on to another uh, uh, project which was uh, uh, which is very interesting, and the opposite end of the size uh, range <coughs> of, of components. Image slicing optics, uh, again, uh, James Webb Space Telescope component. The mid-infrared instrument uh, was a British-UK uh, astronomy centre um, component for the, um, uh, for, for the telescope. <coughs> the, I do explain a little bit about the organisation here that was actually the project uh, was the work of Cranfield University with the UK Astronomy Technology Centre the machine used was a nano centre which is a, a, a much smaller lathe than the one we've seen before and, and in a normal lathe configuration with a horizontal rotary axis <coughs> but uh, one that we'd made some years before uh, and uh, 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 was when we separated from the university it remained the property of the university uh, but I was personally involved in devising the method of um, cutting these components and writing the part program but uh, it involves a great deal of, of uh, very meticulous uh, mechanical work by the university technicians to actually make the parts 
there's a, a quick view of the uh, nanocenter lathe, a horizontal axis uh, rotating here. <clears throat> and the part that had to be made was this. And it took me a little while to understand what it was when I just was handed a specification. Could we make this, Richard? <coughs> it consists of 22 separate spherical mirrors, <coughs> all uh, machined onto one block of metal. <coughs> And uh, <coughs> uh, it's used to slice the image so that uh, a spectrographic single snap, if you like, gets uh, 22 uh, spatially different uh, points on, on a view from uh, one view from the telescope. <coughs> and the, these are tiny. Though those slices on that picture are one millimetre wide, each one and 12 millimetres long to make it useful we have to cut uh, right sharply uh, and between differentiate between between the mirrors not have any curva curvature in there <coughs> this um, this one looks uh, different from the previous one as you can see in that th this has 22 segments this picture has one huge eight millimeter wide segment <coughs> to enable them to, to um, test more easily optically that we've done the right thing uh, with the machine was uh, uh, finding the center of curvature and testing the sphericity of each of these segments uh, was going to take a bit of time so this was the first uh, prototype piece that they wanted <coughs> this view is looking in this direction, looking at the the mirrors for uh, looking at eleven of the mirrors, one side of the of that assembly <coughs> of that component, and it shows here the centres of the different spheres. So this is the centre of the sphere that's in this stripe here. This is the centre of the, of this stripe, and so on. <coughs> to make these on a lathe, we had to successively position the components so that each of these points lies on the centre of rotation of the lathe. <coughs> and uh, to do that, we uh, created a, a big assembly like this. So, th so this will rotate and hold the component in here. Looking at the inside, here's the area where we're going to cut the mirrors. And this has to be stepped up and down to... Uh, <coughs> And to get the, uh, success, the stripes of the mirrors uh, onto the uh, axis of rotation. Uh, my colleague Mike Evans came up with the idea of doing that position in using uh, gauge blocks, which uh, you may not be familiar with, but they are standard equipment in the high precision um, uh, workshops and uh, are relatively easy to purchase. And these are simply rectangular blocks of uh, steel or carbide, only uh, perhaps about 30 millimetres by 10 millimetres, which can be calibrated by national laboratories to, uh, to very high accuracy. And this one, for instance, has one block that's 1.0005 millimetres thick, and the next one here, 1.001. .001. So you can, uh, these can be run together uh, to make an assembly with a, uh, an accuracy and resolution around the half a micron value. So using stacks of these, we were able, we were able to position the, this block up and down with considerable accuracy. <coughs> the other um, thing we had to do that was rather unusual, normally if we're cutting a, a curved component, we would have a, a round and ended tip to the tool. But because uh, in this case we're cutting a series of steps, so the, here is one of the spherical areas and here's the next one, we need, to, we need to have a curved edge to the tool, but then cut it off with a sharp corner, which is not structurally optimum, but it's, the, it's what we needed to do to, to make the desired shape where this curved mirror will end here abruptly and then the next one can be started with no light or a minimum possible light loss in this uh, in the corner <coughs> and we need two of these of opposite hands one to cut the steps on one side another to cut the steps on the other side 
and amazingly, it all worked. We, uh, so, so here's the breadboard piece with, with the one wide stripe and uh, uh, 14 <coughs> of the one millimetre stripes. And here's a picture of, the, uh, of one of the finished parts, which is a bit more sophisticated in having a textured surface here to, uh, to minimise stray light problems, <coughs> um, but has the, t the 22 segments cut on it there. And there are several of these then waiting for JWST to launch uh, buried deeply in the instrumentation there. So now I want to move on to uh, finally to really talk about two machines together, uh, which represent um, the, the present generation of uh, high precision machines. The um, as, as you know from any branch of technology, the, what has changed in the past uh, couple of decades is that uh, huge amounts more processing power and memory are available um, at, at almost no cost. <clears throat> and that affects our ability both in the design and in the control system possibilities. Uh, so uh, instead of drawing things on pieces of paper, uh, two-dimensional views, uh, designers now create a... 3D model of a part and then have to extract 2D views so that it can be manufactured as often as not. <coughs> uh, finite element analysis <coughs> uh, can be used e easily and we, we already had it when I was at university but uh, it was something done by specialists and they used the biggest computers available and they had to run overnight to do a single analysis. Uh, nowadays uh, the uh, designer does it on his desktop. <coughs> uh, on the control side, we've got better performing axis drives, <coughs> uh, both uh, with the mechanics. Uh, for instance, uh, better magnets mean you can get more powerful motors, <coughs> uh, but also particularly on the software side. Within our controller, we can do a lot more calculations and we can update the uh, position demands to the machine at a much higher frequency than we used to be able to do. And a, a, a separate aside is that uh, we have simulation programs. Um, we can model and observe how a machine responds to controls uh, without having to actually run the machine itself, uh, which uh, is obviously a much more uh, uh, potentially very costly operation if you um, have a collision. <coughs> So the first of these, two, the first of the last two machines, is uh, the Cranfield University box. <coughs> uh, this machine was a sort of collaborative project, and they were very much the design authority and decided what they wanted. Um, but we provided the uh, the actual people doing the design work, and the actual mechanical assembly work was done uh, by ourselves, <coughs> and then they uh, have operated it. And this machine was specifically made for uh, producing ELT, extremely large telescope uh, segments. Um, <coughs> and, and there's one hexagonal piece of uh, Zerador here in this picture. <coughs> um, the, this machine, in order to maximize the stiffness, they created it as, as a box shape, which is one of the reasons for the name. Um, to, uh, which has um, made it very stiff, but also makes it quite difficult of access to uh, load and unload components and or to change a grinding wheel. And they have successfully, um, with with other uh, people from the UK who do the polishing and, and so on and optical testing, they successfully made a set of test um, segments for the ELT. And this is one of them. Uh, you can just see the machine I was just talking about in the background there. More or less the same generation, just a, a, a few years later, and very much current, in fact, um, <coughs> are these machines um, made by uh, Cranfield Precision. <coughs> um, we've so far produced two sizes, uh, 1,200 and 1,600 millimetre diameters. Um, here's an illustration of, of what I was saying about the FEA analysis. The, <coughs> the designer now can produce a, a model of the part that he's uh, 
uh, he's interested in, and uh, in, uh, in in not very long time he can uh, set he can set it up for us, uh, an, an analysis, for instance, to determine which parts will deflect most easily, or what its resonant frequencies uh, are. <coughs> Or also to do thermal analysis, uh, how it will distort if uh, heat's injected at particular points. And then to actually run one of these tests only takes a, a, a few minutes or half an hour. Uh, they can get, make a, a small change to the design and run it again and, and see if they've achieved an improvement. <coughs> so it's a much more practical tool than it used to be and can lead to uh, a designs of considerable complexity where we know we've put the material where it wants to be, not, uh, not just, uh, well, very different from the OAGM where we made big rectangular blocks. Those are what we could calculate by hand the deflections of. That was a slight aside on the mechanical design side. The thing I'm, uh, uh, I'm personally most involved with and is of, of interest uh, to talk about is that both of these machines pose us uh, particular uh, control problems. They both have chosen because to make the, to maximise the stiffness to have use cylindrical coordinates, so a, a C axis, an X and a Z axis, rather than uh, what the shape is described as, which would be orthogonal X Y Z coordinates. A priori, that doesn't look like too difficult a transformation to do, but uh, as you'll see, there are certain that does cause certain problems. <coughs> We, other constraints that we have <coughs> are that the uh, shape of the cutting tool is defined by the process. The process engineer uh, also tends to want to specify how fast the cutting point moves across the part. That's, uh, uh, if that's not consistent, then he'll get uh, different uh, surface qualities at different points. And he also wants to define the path that the machine will follow. So the, with those machines, the most obvious path to do is a spiral because you've got a rotary axis and two linear axes. But there are situations where you might prefer to do movements in straight lines. The uh, difficulty I mentioned, one of the difficulties arises from the fact that uh, we are given uh, a formula that tells us uh, dimensions of, uh, of a mirror surface represented here in blue but we need to know the machine positions that correspond to that. So here are a couple of positions of a possible uh, tool, and you can see, obviously, what the machine has to do is not the same as what the point on the surface of the part does. And uh, that that's actually is quite a challenging um, calculation to do because it's actually a three-dimensional problem. The tool... Uh, might be a sphere, but is more often a torus, um, so, uh, and c will be at different angles at different uh, points to the, uh, to the surface of the part. So it's quite a, a, it's a calculation with no explicit solution. And uh, as soon as you've got something where it says the calculation might take a different length of time, uh, it sends shivers down your spine if you're doing real-time calculations to move big lumps of machinery. <coughs> Uh, also, you, when you solve this problem, you find there's almost always two solutions. If you chose one solution uh, at one point in the machine cycle and then the next millisecond you asked it to be in the, uh, a solution 180 degrees away on the rotary table, that would be rather bad news. <coughs> uh, and in some situations there are no solutions or only one solution or an infinite number of solutions and we need to handle all those situations. <coughs> And we might want to do that every clock cycle of the machine. But with the vast amount of memory storage we have, it's possible, instead of worrying about this calculation being done in real time, we could calculate, say, 36 million points in advance, save them all, and then uh, uh, squirt them out at 1 kilohertz to, as demands to the machine position. Another problem of, the, of that axis orientation is uh, when the process engineer is demanding constant velocity, but we're coming near the C-axis of rotation, <coughs> we could uh, uh, be asking for infinite velocity. So usually we uh, think in terms of this 
equation v equals omega r, where uh, you rotating at some uh, value at speed of omega, and the velocity relates. So if you're at a small radius, you get a small velocity. If you're at a large radius, you get a large velocity. But now our uh, process engineer has said, I want v constant. Then uh, at this point, we get a, some useful value of, of omega. But as the radius tends to zero, we get close to the center. Then the demand for the rotary axis speed uh, comes tends to infinity. So in that case, we have to compromise with the process engineer's requirements. We can't, uh, we can't change the uh, laws of, of uh, geometry. <coughs> But uh, one great bonus of the recent developments is being able to do uh, simulations uh, graphically. And I'll finish with a couple of uh, uh, videos of that. <coughs> so this is the machine we saw uh, earlier, the uh, OGM 1200 machine, with the base and structure removed and the covers removed. So all you see is the x-axis here, the rotary axis, and... Uh, the vertical z-axis. And, uh, <coughs> and we got a rectangular part which will be convenient to machine in straight lines. There's the shape of the, of the tool. It, it's, it's a slice out of a torus. And here you can see we're able to generate straight lines by doing clever movements with the, uh, with the x and z-axis uh, and the, and the c-axis. In the, um, on the component here, the, the blank is red. The, uh, white represents a, a cut surface. And uh, buried in the component is a green uh, desired shape, if you like. So this, this is good. It's, um, it's just grazing the green surface and uh, leaving a bit of white between the stripes because, it's, uh, the, it, because of the curvature of the tool. <coughs> If, um, if we dug into the, into the part, we'd see a solid mass of green. If we didn't touch the part, we'd see a solid mass of white. <coughs> it's quite uh, entertaining to watch the, uh, the shape of the, of, of, the, of the cutting surfaces. In, in real life, this would take a, uh, a longer time um, in that the, the stripes would be much closer together. Some of these cuts typically can take uh, six hours, ten hours, that kind of thing. But this is, this is very useful for modelling the part. So we can see the finished part with a series of straight lines on it. These uh, uh, odd curves here are, are just due to the finite elements that are used in the part. They're, just, they're an artefact of the process. And finally, here's a spiral cut, but on a very weird part. The specification for the machine said it could deal with, surface, with surfaces of up to 45 degrees slope. So I invented a formula for a part that would have such extreme slopes. And uh, using this, in this case, a spherical tool, because it's going to come right round 45 degrees at different points on the surface of the, of the tool. <coughs> Uh, there's only a, a few revs of this, but I think you get the idea that here it's got to the cutting point's got to move right up behind the part uh, behind the, the tool. Here the, the cutting point is round to this side. As it goes up this side, it's it's coming round again to come round behind the the back of the tool. But we were able to uh, generate from this surface the demands required of the machine to to do this uh, extreme case, which nobody actually wants something this bad, but uh, there are plenty of aspherical <laughs> surfaces, um, much less extreme, that do require this, the same kind of calculation. So this was testing it to its limit. And that's it. Uh, six uh, different machines, six different aspects. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. some
questions? Mike. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I'm definitely not an engineer, <laughs> so I have probably oh, some. <laughs> so I have some probably very basic questions. So uh, these diamond cutting edges, uh, are particularly the one that's the, the straight edge and then curved. So how how are they constructed? <laughs> Subcontract that to people who make uh, these tools, but the, they are single crystal diamonds which are. Uh, cemented onto the end of, a, of a, a chunk of metal, which is a normal lathe tool holder. Uh, they, they will then uh, grind uh, with a diamond grinding wheel the, the shape using uh, an instrument which, again, which has its own rotary axis. And then I think for those um, sharp cut-off ones, they, they, they initially make more of a complete radius and then slice... <coughs> Slice off to get the corner in the required place. Uh, other question was um, so one of the other recent developments technologically has been 3D printing. Is that relevant at all for these kind of machines? It's um, not. We don't use it. We haven't used it very much. But for 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 the less structurally important parts of the machine. Uh, it, it's, it's great for being able to make awkward shapes uh, and to be able to produce them uh, more or less straight from the 3D model. Um, uh, but uh, the, you, usually the, um, the results of 3D printing are not, very, are not as structurally um, sound as, as a solid lump of, of cast iron or, or a, 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 a resin uh, a casting or, or that kind of uh, thing. Convenience for non-essential parts. Uh, yeah, for, yeah. yeah, for so the, the the pretty parts rather than the functional parts, uh, the, it is uh, I think is where the um, the emphasis lies at the moment. Uh, thanks so much for your nice talk, and I would like to ask you a question about uh, the possibility of going a bit uh, digital in this kind of things. For instance, uh, taking into account all the numerical calculation that you do, um, the expertise you have with the damage and this kind of uh, things in the astronomy instrumentation. Uh, have you thought about uh, going to, or to make into the business of predictive uh, damage, of predicting the, the damage of the uh, sun instruments? For instance, taking into account sun focus on the uh, Internet of Things or the digital twins or so. I mean, to try to predict uh, the damage of uh, before the, um, the, it occurs or it happens. Test uh, to examine instruments that have been damaged, or that were were good once, and then. I mean, you have scope and you have a bunch or amount of uh, technology of uh, instruments inside. And um, what about uh, trying to check in in re real time? Uh, with sensor, what is uh, the pressure or temperature or the damage, and to make some kind of predictive modeling, and in order to be able to predict if, if something is going wrong, it uh, will uh, be wrong in uh, in the next uh, two hours. So, um, well. <clears throat> You, you were thinking if we apply our controllers to an instrument that somebody else has made or that yeah. is... Uh, kind of yeah. mm. Or a computer model uh, reproducing what uh, the sensor are saying to you in real time and trying to predict uh, the damage. Do you know if in some companies doing... In machine tools um, and in, uh, in these grinding machines, for instance, there is, uh, there is often monitoring of the... Uh, the motion of the grinding wheel uh, to and the, so that they would um, and of temperatures and so on, but particularly the they can see if uh, if the wheel is starting to be damaged, they they detect vibrations that are coming off the machine. 
Um, and well, as, as you've seen, some of the stuff we've all, all we've been doing right from square one is 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 a continuous monitoring process of the for the metrology purposes with uh, with the with the lasers. Generally, the the machines we produce are are relatively big and lightly used, so um, damage isn't the, the, mach, the machine itself is unless you really have a collision is is unlikely to to suffer damage in normal use. But it, it's fairly common in production machinery to be monitoring the vibrations, temperatures, uh, current uh, that goes to the motors and so on, and that, thus to, as well as measuring the parts that come off the machines too, and thus to be able to predict that it's time to change a tool on a, uh, on a machine or, uh, or time for some more serious service before um, anything really serious goes wrong. If not, let's uh, again, Richard.